So my name is uh, Kevin Sawinski, and I'll be your speaker um, for the first about two and a half hours this morning. Uh, it's, uh, I think, a topic that uh, probably, in terms of exam preparation, scares a lot of people, uh, perhaps especially the biostats piece of this. And uh, I'll do my best to try to demystify that a little bit. Uh, just to give you some perspective about where I'm coming from in terms of this talk, one, I'm not a statistician uh, and, and don't have uh, any graduate training in statistics or anything of that sort, so I'm coming as an applied user of, uh, of statistics. I'm a former item writer and uh, BPS council member for pharmacotherapy, I certainly don't know what's going to be on this exam. It's been a long time since I've been on the board, but I'll try, be, try to give you per, some perspective about what things I think are important. Uh, and uh, so I think it's time to get started. I don't have any conflicts uh, related to this presentation, and I'm certain you can't see those in the back, but uh, they're in your book, and uh, we'll uh, try to cover these uh, throughout uh, throughout today. All right, so, so what is this and what isn't it? Well, this is not an exhaustive review of biostatistics. It is what the, the workbook says it is. It's a refresher on biostatistics. Um, some of you may come uh, with uh, more of this material than others. And uh, so we'll try to cover what I think is important for this exam. Uh, but again, it's, it's not meant to be an exhaustive review. We'll talk about uh, what I think you need to know, uh, and then we'll go through uh, specific topics related to, to biostatistics in, in an effort to, uh, to prepare you for, uh, for the exam. I know some of you are here recertifying, and uh, just as a general disclaimer, most of what I'm going to talk about is really focused on those that are, that are sitting for, for the exam. All right, so, so what is statistics? There's a cartoon out there that, uh, that I didn't put in here that describes this, um, that, that stats is a means for collecting, classifying, summarizing, and analyzing data. Demystifying, probably not. Maybe it uh, makes uh, interpretation of uh, the data by some even more challenging. Uh, we'll see that it's uh, useful for quantifying uh, clinical and laboratory data in a meaningful way, and it assists in determining whether or how much of a treatment or procedure affects a group. So we'll talk about inferential statistics, that is, using statistics on a sample and then applying that to a larger group, which of course is a major piece of, of stats. So why do pharmacists need to know stats? Well, hopefully it's obvious to this group, uh, and uh, we'll talk about what we need to know. So I think this is a pretty good primer on what tests I think you should enter this exam at least being familiar with. You're certainly not going to have to do them, uh, except perhaps calculate a mean and a median and probably not a standard deviation, but a range. Um, you're not going to have to know how to do the others, but you're certainly going to have to recognize them. All right, and if you're interested, you can see the reference that this comes from this would be a good place to start. And we'll go through most of these in the remaining 70 or so minutes. Why should it be important to you now? 25% of this exam covers stuff that we're going to talk about today. All right? 25%. There's some additional uh, things such as drug information topics that we're not going to cover. Uh, there are some research topics that likely we're going to run out of time. You have a full slide deck with about 140 some odd slides from these two presentations that we're most likely not going to get through all of them, but you have the slides, you have the handout. Um, that's about 25% of your exam. This is my third uh, trip through these slides, uh, first to the PEDS group, second to the, the AMCARE group, and your advantage over AMCARE is this only counts for 14% of their exam, but they have to know it all anyways. All right, so 25%, I think that's a good number. I was really excited when I found that out when I took this exam a long time ago. 
All right, so let's get started with uh, data first, and then we'll talk about statistics. All right, so we're going to start with discrete variables because they're the most basic. So these are variables that can take a limited number of values within a given range. And the two that are shown on the slide that are most commonly discussed are nominal and ordinal um, variables. So nominal variables are yes, no type of variables. And you can see on the slide that uh, classifying someone into either male or female sex would be an example of that. Describing whether, whether they're alive or whether they're not alive would be an example of a nominal variable and then whether or not a disease is present or absent. Okay, so um, no indication of relative severity, yes, no type questions. Ordinal extends this a little bit more, and now we're speaking of ranking, okay, ranking variables in a specific order, but with no consistent magnitude between the ranks. And the, the New York Heart Association functional classification for heart failure is an example of a commonly used uh, ordinal type of data. So individuals are ranked via symptomatology, one being no symptoms, four being severe symptoms. Okay, the magnitude of difference between one and two is not necessarily the same as between two and three. All right, so nominal and ordinal data. Continuous variables, on the other hand, are counting variables. They can take any value within a given range, and there's two main types of scales. There's interval scale, okay, in which data are ranked in a specific order with a consistent change in magnitude, but the absolute zero value is arbitrary. The most common example of this is degrees Fahrenheit. Contrasting that with ratio scale data, now there's no arbitrary zero point there's a fixed absolute zero. Okay, it's the same as interval. The example of this is the other temperature scale, degrees Kelvin, which has an absolute zero. And many common clinical measures, heart rate, blood pressure, time, distance, are examples of, of uh, ratio scale data. Right, we're gonna talk about two types of statistics. Statistics that describe and statistics that make inferences, i.e. descriptive and inferential statistics. So descriptive statistics are used to summarize, and I know I'm not supposed to use this word in the definition, but I am. They summarize and describe data that are collected or generated in research studies. And they're done either visually or numerically. Inferential statistics, on the other hand, are statistics that are used to make conclusions or generalizations made about a group, okay, from a sample of that group. You want to say it in statistical jargon, made about a population from a sample of that population, okay, because we obviously can't, we can't study the whole population. All right, we're going to start with descriptive statistics, and there's three ways in which to show data, and three of them are, there's more than three ways, but three of them are shown on this slide. One is a frequency distribution, two is a histogram, and three is a scatter plot, which the last one I'm certain everybody's pretty com comfortable with, but seen here is a frequency distribution showing frequency <coughs> of data points, and the data points are anti-factor 10A concentrations. And what we're going to do at some point is to figure out whether or not this frequency distribution, okay, is normally distributed or not. Or we'll do this with a similar type of data set, okay? So this is why it would be useful to, to look at um, these types of, uh, of figures. All right, let's talk about uh, numerical methods to describe data. And we're going to start with measures of central tendency. So we have three measures of central tendency, the mean, the median, and the mode. And I think the mean is one that, that most everyone is pretty comfortable with. You will almost assuredly have to calculate a mean or interpret a mean on this exam, all right? Uh, more likely, you're, you're gonna have to interpret and you're gonna be tested on whether or not you know that the mean should only be used for continuous and normally distributed data. All right, it should not be used for other type of data. 
And the reason for that is it's very sensitive to outliers. It tends to be pulled towards the tail of a distribution in which there are outliers. All right? We've just described it's probably the most commonly used and, and well understood um, me measure of central tendency. The median, also known as the 50th percentile, is the midpoint of values. If you put values in a row from smallest to largest, it's the middle value in that distribution. If you have an even number of data points, then it's the average between the two middle values. All right, it's used for either ordinal, okay, like the New York Heart Association class classification, or like a Likert scale, uh, or continuous data, all right, especially in the case where there's skewed distributions. It's relatively insensitive to outliers, all right, so it's not going to be pulled towards uh, the point of that distribution in which there's an outlier. The mode is the most common value in a distribution, and it can be used for any of the three types of data that we've discussed, nominal, ordinal, or continuous data. Some other facts uh, relative to mode that are, that are illustrated on that slide. Uh, distributions can have more than one mode, and those are termed bimodal or, or trimodal distributions. All right, how do we quantify the spread or variability that exists within uh, an individual data set? Well, the standard deviation is one means to do that, and that's a measure of the variability that exists about the mean in a data set. And the standard deviation, like the mean, should only be applied to continuous data, underlined for emphasis, Okay, standard deviation should only be applied to continuous data that are what statisticians will refer to as approximately normally distributed. All right, and, and we'll talk about how we can figure out whether or not something is approximately normally distributed. Uh, recall uh, something maybe you've heard about or not heard about or care to forget about something called the empirical rule. The empirical rule is a rule that states that because a mean and a standard deviation defines a distribution, that 68% of the values that were collected and described by that mean and standard deviation fall within plus or minus one standard deviation. 95% within two, 99% within three. So, so those of you who remember that first organic chemistry exam that you took, uh, I got a 25 on mine, and I got a B. <laughs> well, that's because I was in this second set of standard deviations, right? Um, so empiric empirical rule is useful. It's not really a useful tool to use in the classroom to grade, but uh, it was in my organic class, so. All right. Coefficient of variation is another term that I think is important for you to recognize. It describes or relates the mean to the standard deviation of a sample. All right, and you can see the formula, the standard deviation divided by the mean times 100%. And then lastly, the variance is the standard deviation squared. So, so you could be expected to perhaps have to go between these three measures, all right, and know how a variance relates to a standard deviation know how a coefficient of variation relates to a standard deviation. The range, on the other hand, is pretty easy. If, if you can do subtraction, you can calculate the range. It's the difference between the smallest and the largest value in a data set. Okay? You could perhaps be expected to do this, but maybe not expected to calculate the standard deviation on an exam. Uh, it's very sensitive to outliers, obviously, because it's going to extend the complete data set. It's often reported as the actual value, okay, rather than the difference between the two extreme values. Percentiles are related to the range, and they're a point on, in a distribution in which the value is larger than some percentage of other values. For example, in the, if we describe the 75th percentile of a data set, 75% of values are going to be smaller than that 
that particular point on the distribution. Okay, and this particular uh, measure does not assume a population has a normal or any other distribution. All right, in contrast to what a standard deviation, uh, what the assumptions of a standard deviation are. Uh, one of the commonly used uh, related terms to the range is the interquartile range, which describes the 75th, I'm sorry, the 25th to 75th percentile, or the middle 50% of values in a data set. All right, so the interquartile range. All right, so uh, you'll, you'll probably find by the end of this two and a half hours uh, maybe a little bit less use of your cards than, than you may see in some other talks. Uh, but we're going to start with uh, an application type question, and all you need is your green or your red card. So this is a paper that we published uh, uh, about uh, five years ago in which we asked some, question, some PharmD students in our biostatistics class some questions about how we were doing. All right, and we, in that particular question, we asked them to, like you're going to be asked to do in a, in a couple of days, or actually tomorrow, is uh, provide some feedback to, to the presenters. And we asked questions about examination questions, and we asked students uh, to, um, to answer based on a Likert scale. Okay, one to five. Strongly ag disagree, we were doing really bad strongly agree we were doing really, really well. So you can see over the first three years of the course, 2006 through 2008, um, this is the average, about two and a half, and it increases with time. The, the median in the interquartile range is shown below. So, so which of those, the mean in the standard deviation or the median in the interquartile range is the most appropriate way to represent the central tendency and dispersion of that data. Mean for green, median for red. Okay, a lot of people aren't playing this morning. They're still drinking their first cup of coffee. I thought somebody was gonna put a blue up. They wanted uh, a different answer. All right, so the correct answer in this case is the median in the interquartile range. All right, uh, that's because the Likert scale, like the New York Heart Association functional classification, is a ranked scale, but the difference between one and two is not necessarily the same as between two and three. So you might ask, well, why the heck did you publish both in this paper? Well, because a reviewer told us we had to. They told us nobody is going to understand what a median is, so you show us the wrong thing. All right, so we had to show both. Um, there, there is some controversy in the statistics literature. Yeah, I read a little bit of the stats literature um, about Likert scales and the use of means, but I don't want to confuse you and go there. So in this case, median is the most appropriate way to, to represent these data. All right, so let's summarize what we've talked about relative to, to measures of data spread and variability and central tendency. All right, whenever we read papers, we should look for both a measure of central, central tendency being presented as well as data spread and variability. So what measures of central tendency should be presented with continuous and, or in, continuous interval scale data should be means or averages. With ordinal data should be medians. Could be modes as well. And then what measure of spread and variability should be presented with means should be the standard deviation. With medians, it should be the range or the interquartile range. All right, so again, continuous interval scale data, we want to present the mean. Ordinal data, we want to present the median, or we could also use the mode. Uh, in terms of spread and variability, we present the standard deviation with the mean and the range or the interquartile range with the medium. It makes absolutely no sense to present data as the median and the standard deviation. Makes absolutely no sense. Um, so mean, mean with standard deviation, median with range. All right, so look, let's look at an example. Um, this may be a perfectly uh, 
uh, fine example for something that you might be expected to do um, on this type of exam. So one would be to calculate the mean, the median, and the mode of the above data set. And these are 20 HDL concentrations that were, that were obtained from a small study relative to the consumption of, of red wine that was being studied in that particular study. Can you do this? And I think most of you can do this, um, hopefully. Can you calculate the range, the standard deviation, and a concept that we haven't discussed yet, and we will, the standard error of the mean? And we'll talk about how the standard error of the mean differs from the standard deviation, and then evaluate the visual presentation of, of these data. All right, so I've done that for you. You can practice at home. The measures of central tendency are all shown here, the mean, the median, and the mode, and the mean and the median are pretty close to one another. And we'll use that concept in a second to help us to figure out what this distribution is likely to look like. I've calculated the standard deviation, which is a little bit challenging to do on an exam without a, uh, a scientific calculator. And so I don't expect you'll be asked to do that, but perhaps evaluate that concept. Then the range and the interquartile range um, is also calculated. Standard error of the mean I've done for you. Again, we're going to describe that in a second. So let's evaluate the visual presentation of these data. All right, I'm not going to ask you this question yet. I want you to think about this is a, a, a similar frequency distribution histogram that, that we looked at before. This uh, shows the HDL concentrations on the x-axis and the frequency of occurrence of each of these concentration ranges on the y-axis. And we're going to eventually answer the question, hopefully, as to whether or not we think this is normally distributed. Okay, Think in your own mind uh, whether or not it is. And we'll come back to that in, in just a second. So we're going to switch to inferential statistics and then apply inferential statistics to our, to our data set um, in just a second. All right, so we said inferential statistics, we're, we're making, we're using our sample to make conclusions about a larger population that that sample was taken from. All right, uh, we'll talk about how we choose and evaluate statistical methods relative to that. Okay, and uh, we can do statistical inference by a couple of different ways, either by estimation, that's by using confidence intervals, or by hypothesis testing, okay? And that would be by showing p-values. Um, and we'll talk about both of those means, both of those ways. Both of those means is not a good way to say that. All right, so we're going to start with uh, uh, the population distribution that everyone's most familiar with, and that's the normal distribution, or sometimes referred to as a Gaussian distribution. It's the most common model. It's symmetric, it's bell-shaped, again, just like back to that organic chemistry uh, exam. There are some important landmarks, statistical landmarks, statistical jargon. The population mean of that distribution is equal to zero, and it's denoted by the Greek letter mu. All right, the population standard deviation is equal to one, and it's denoted by sigma. And then the sample mean, x bar, or little x is shown here, and little s represent the, the sample mean and the standard deviation. Okay, and a picture of it looks like that. Again, with the mean in the middle of this distribution. And uh, just like we've talked about relative to the number of standard deviations away from the mean, that's what the picture looks like. All right, so we're going to go back to our HDL example. And I've superimposed a normal distribution on that histogram. And so we're going to ask the question, do you think by a show of green that this is normally distributed, by a show of red, uh, by a show of red, no, by a show of green, yes. All right, as I expected, there's, the, there's a mix, probably a little bit more green than red. Um, and so let's try to answer this question. By looking at it, my first gut reaction would be yes. Okay? That data set is approximately normally distributed. Remember, this is, this is 20 samples, 
Okay, pretty small sample size. And we're, we're trying to figure out if, if, it's, if we can make the assumption that it's normally distributed. So how do we do that? Well, we should look at the picture like we've just done. Two, the easiest way to do this, okay, is to compare the mean and the median. And we've done that, and the mean and the median in this case is 61 and 60.8. Those are pretty close. All right, so that's my best guess at, at the fact that these are normally distributed data. We can do a formal test that uh, my students in stats class used to refer to as the vodka test, the Komolgarov smirnov test, okay, which is a formal test to, uh, to determine whether or not something is approximately normally distributed. Um, and I would conclude based on uh, this and the picture that we looked at before that, that these data are approximately normally distributed. If you actually do this test, that test would be in agreement with that assumption. All right. Remember, I hate to mention uh, pharmacokinetics because that's maybe the topic that scares people second most besides biostats and clinical study design. But just like the clearance and the volume of distribution define the pharmacokinetics of a drug and what its profile looks like, the mean and the standard deviation are parameters that describe your data set, all right? Which is why we call them parametric tests because they have some underlying parameters that describe their distribution. All right, so let's just add to the confusion about standard deviations and, and variability and, and introduce the term the standard error of the mean. All right, so the standard error of the mean is defined as the standard deviation divided, divided by the square root of n. All right, and, and by definition or by, by math, that's always going to be smaller than the standard deviation. Right? The standard error of the mean, as opposed to the standard deviation, the standard error of the mean quantifies uncertainty that exists about the mean not about the variability that exists in your data set, all right? Quantifies uncertainty in the estimate of the mean, not in the variability of your sample. So it shouldn't be used to describe the variability in your sample. Why is it worth uh, knowing about besides this factor, the difference between standard error of the mean and standard deviation? Well, the application of it is, is we use the standard error of the mean to estimate confidence intervals. And a 95% confidence interval is approximately the mean plus or minus two times the standard error of the mean. All right, it's actually 1.96. You might remember that back from your stats class. Uh, but we approximate two because, well, it's easier. Oftentimes, the standard error of the mean is used deceptively to make data look a little tighter than they are, and here's an example of that. And it's not a great example, it's from our HDL example again. Um, so which of the following, this is HDL concentrations, and this is the data represented as, represented as the mean, plus, or, or plus the standard deviation, this is represented as the mean, plus the standard error of the mean. Which of those two, orange or yellow, and I won't make you raise your cards, is the appropriate way to, to represent that data? And the answer is um, by the orange, uh, the orange bar, all right? You can see in this case, it's not a, it, there's not huge variability in the data, but uh, often individuals use this deceptively to make their data look uh, a little bit tighter than it really is. All right, this segues nicely into confidence intervals. Uh, recall that 95% confidence intervals are typically the most commonly reported confidence intervals. And what that means uh, in, uh, in non-stats jargon is that if we were able to do repeated samples in that same, from that same population, 
then 95% of all confidence intervals would include the true population value. All right. Why are 95% confidence intervals most oftenly reported? Because that corresponds to a p-value of 0 0.05. All right, so 95% confidence intervals are used for that reason. There's a, 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 an example of calculating a confidence interval that's shown here. I'll let you work through that. But I will warn you that uh, uh, the concepts, I, I think the testable concept in this case is, is that standard deviations and standard error of the means and confidence intervals are often used interchangeably, incorrectly, by individuals. And so the, the concept here, the testable concept, is to be able to, to sort out the differences between these, what they are, and be able to interpret those. So we can use confidence intervals in, instead of standard hypothesis testing. And standard hypothesis testing, perhaps like you did back in your stats class, involves uh, hypothesis testing with a null and alternative hypothesis and then a calculation of p-values to tell us whether or not a statistically significant difference exists. Okay. But what it doesn't tell us anything about is what's the magnitude of that difference? Right? We just get a p-value. Maybe it's got 55 zeros and we're really impressed by that. But it doesn't really tell us anything about what's the, the real-life application of that difference and what's the, the actual difference. So, that, so that's what confidence intervals do. They provide us with an idea of the magnitude of difference, perhaps, between two treatments. If we're looking at in our statistical evaluation, the difference between two continuous variables. Let's say we want to evaluate LDL concentrations in two groups. Okay? When, we, when we set out to design our study, if it's two drug therapies that we assume are, are similar, then our hypothesis would be that there's no difference between those two groups. Right? So our confidence interval is set up such that if or our, our test is set up such that if our confidence interval includes zero, i.e., no difference, then we would conclude that uh, there's no statistically significant finding. All right? And the p-value associated with that, all we can tell is it's greater than 0 0.05. There's no need to show both the 95% confidence interval and the p-value. All right? They both do their jobs independently of one another. And in the second uh, part or second section of, of this morning's, we'll talk about confidence intervals for odds ratios and risk ratios and, and how they differ from the example I just gave. All right, so, so hypothesis testing, just as a general and basic review, Obviously, when we, when we design a, a research study and we set up a, a, a hypothesis, generally speaking, the null hypothesis describes no difference between the two comparator values. In this case, treatment A is equal to treatment B. We set the alternative hypothesis then to state that there is a difference. So treatment, e, treatment A excuse me, is not equal to treatment B. We do our statistical test, okay, and the results of that statistical test will indicate whether there's enough evidence, okay, to reject the null hypothesis. And if the null hypothesis is rejected, then we conclude that there's a statistically significant difference. If the null hypothesis is not rejected, then we conclude that there is no statistical difference. Okay, and remember, we're not we're not concluding that the treatments are equal, all right? We're concluding that uh, there's uh, either a statistically sig significant difference or no statistically significant difference. Now, some may argue, okay, well, what about an equivalence trial or something along those lines where our conclusion's a little bit different? I'll let you uh, sort through that information. We're just gonna hit, we're just gonna touch on it very briefly. In fact, Table four in your handout describes different types of hypothesis tests. 
non-directional, directional, and I'm going to let you, for the sake of time, review that information. And again, we'll come back to it in the second half of, of the second presentation uh, to discuss these factors a little bit more. Not much more, but a little bit more. All right, so let's, uh, let's talk about, or at least start to talk about, statistical tests and how we would choose a statistical test given a specific set of data. And, and the, how we choose a test is going to be dependent on a variety of different factors. One is, what do the data look like? So what I promised to do, and of course what I forgot to do, was, was to tell you that if you're interested, and I have no uh, uh, financial stake uh, or other stake in this textbook. I'm not an editor, not an author. This is offered by ACCP. It's called the Clinical Pharmacist Guide to Biostatistics and Literature Evaluation. And why am I talking about it now? Because I just jogged my memory about. But it, basically, this, this text has several chapters and then lots of questions, multiple choice type questions that, that go through some concepts. But wh why am I talking about it now? There's also a couple of flow diagrams in this text that are perhaps different than the one that I've provided in the handout. And some may like that better than that what I've described. So if you're interested, it's, it's outside. I don't know, it's, it's around $30. I don't know exactly what the cost is. But it's useful. All right, so how we choose a test depends on the type of data. Is it nominal? Is it ordinal? Is it continuous? What's the distribution of the data look like? Is it normally distributed or is it not? All right, so we've talked about these two things. What was the study design employed? Was it a parallel group design or was it a crossover design? Talk a little bit more about this in the second half. We'll talk about some of it now. Was there confounding variables? Do we have to make some adjustments statistically? to our data because of the, the nature of the data that we collected. And then lastly, are we conducting a one-tailed versus a two-tailed test? And in, in most cases, a two-tailed test is going to be used. In fact, the New England Journal of Medicine does not even allow individuals to present data from one-tailed tests. Um, so we, we're not going to talk any more about this. Um, uh, and lastly, uh, what about parametric versus non-parametric tests? So remember that parametric tests, parametric parameter, assume that the data being investigated have an underlying approximately normal distribution. All right, so that's the only time parametric tests are appropriate, that the data are continuous. Well, they have to be, they have to be continuous to be normally distributed. Uh, and that the data being investigated have variances that are approximately equal. And we're really not going to spend any more time on this fact. It's maybe statistics 201 instead of 101. Um, but uh, you should be, uh, have at least in your mind, cognizant that that's the case. Contrasting that for non-parametric tests, they don't assume these, these same um, assumptions. There may be some other assumptions that are necessary for non-parametric tests but not that the data are normally distributed, and generally the data don't have to meet other criteria. So I had people come up to me at the end of this and say, well, let's just use non-parametric tests all the time. Then that's all we have to know, right? Well, non-parametric tests are less powerful if we should be using a parametric test. All right, so non-parametric tests are less powerful if we should be using a parametric test. All right, so let's talk about parametric tests. So I, I'm not sure if everyone has heard the story or not about why a student's t-test is capital, but it has to do with a Guinness brewery and uh, the fact that a student worked at, at the Guinness Brewery and didn't want to use his own name when he published this test, so he used student, all right? And he capitalized it. So that's why students uh, is capitalized, and that's a true story. You can look it up. It's not just urban legend. Uh, now, there are three types of t-tests. 
one sample, two sample paired. So we need to sort out the differences between these because this is a major focus to make sure that you understand the differences between one sample, two sample, and paired. So, so let's look at one sample first. So here's the example for a one sample test. As you leave the room today at, at about 11.45, you're going to consent okay, to a 5cc blood sample. All right? And we're going to measure your LDL cholesterol. N not really. All right? All right? We want to know if the LDL cholesterol of this whole group is different from that of the United States population. So that's the example of one sample as compared to the known population mean. Okay, we know what the average cholesterol concentration is in the U.S. population. And we're going to compare our value to that. All right, so this particular technique would be useful in determining clinical hospital laboratories' normal values. All right, using a normal distribution, using the distribution and the spread of that data, that's, that would be what this is useful for, amongst other things. Okay, what about a two-sample test? All right, so, so as you leave the room, the women are going to be on this side, the men are going to be on this side, each are going to have blood samples taken, and we're going to compare those cholesterol concentrations between the men and the women in the audience. All right, those are two independent, different people in each group. All right, and we're going to compare the LDL concentrations between group one and group two. So independent, often called two sample, unpaired, or independent. Those three things mean the same thing. All right, just to add a little bit of confusion, um, this is really, this is in here for your information primarily. I, I can't fathom you'd be asked a test. Technically, when we compare those, concentrate, those LDL concentrations between the two groups, the assumption to use an independent samples t-test is that the variances between those two groups is the same or approximately the same. All right? If it's not, then we have to, have, we have to use an unequal variance t-test, which is really just a correction. Now, all statistical programs, when you run an independent samples t-test, they do both of them for you and you just have to figure it out. All right, I, I don't think you'd be tested on that, but uh, it's here for your information just in case. All right, what about a paired t-test? All right, so, so three months ago when you registered for this class, you had your LDL concentration obtained. Today when you walk out, we're gonna do it again. Now we have a sample at baseline when you registered, and we have a sample today. And we're going to compare to see if your preparation for today changed your LDL cholesterol. All right, so that would be measurement one when you registered versus measurement two today. So we're comparing in the same individual two different measurements. All right, so this would be uh, the simplest example of a crossover type of design. Right? Two measurements, a before and an after. Paired t-test. Sometimes these are called matched t-tests. Okay? But paired is, is the most common, commonly used nomenclature. All right, so the bad thing about a t-test is that it's only useful for two groups. All right, if we have three groups, Let's say we want to know if the LDL concentrations in this quadrant, this quadrant, and that quadrant are different. Well, we can't use a t-test. We can't say one versus two, two versus three, three versus one. That's multiple t-tests, and that's one of the most common errors in the literature. So what do we do if that's the case? We use ANOVA. All right, so now we have three groups. All right, we're extending 
our unpaired t-test to include three groups and we compare the means LDL here, LDL here, LDL here. All right, we generate one p-value. We can infinitely expand on this discussion. All right, we can add a factor. All right, we want to know if those less than 40 and those older than 40 here in, in this factor analysis and then the similar groups, one, two, and three. All right, and we can keep going and going and going and going, but we won't. Similarly, we can extend a paired t-test, all right? And